to The Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott. Today we're going to have some fun, and I'm going to discuss a chapter by Howard Sherman called Messages and Guidance from the Departed. Here he talks about the idea that we can communicate with those who have died or moved on. Is this possible? I have very personal experiences with this, which I will share with you. It goes deep in my family, the idea and belief that we can communicate with the dead. I've heard it from many other people as well, and there are some mediums that do some amazing things out there. So what is actually happening? Are we communicating with our dearly departed or an aspect of them created from the Akashic record? Can we regularly communicate with them? I know that my father, when my mother died, felt like he could regularly communicate with my mother. And there are a variety of stories of this from people along a lot of different lines. I've experienced a lot of death in my family, and it's one of the things the mind does. It wants to communicate with those who have departed. It's something I desperately wanted to do when my father died. In my own particular case, it goes deep within my family. My great-grandmother was somewhat famous as a spiritualist in Nebraska, and people would come from all over, and she would read for them. She would communicate with the dead that came and a variety of other things. Then it's something my grandfather, who did this all the time, he, people would come to his house, he would say, hey, Uncle Joe's right next to you over there, and Bill just came in. I just saw your sister. She had passed through. He would say these things just naturally. It was no big deal. And he claimed to always see them. Then I had a close cousin in our family that said that all the time. And of course, I visited him after my mother passed. And he said, your mother's been talking to me nonstop. What do we take from these things that people say? I have communicated with the dead in my dreams. And I still question whether or not it's a part of my own imagination that's creating it. That's why I can never say 100%. Harold Sherman, who we've discussed previously in a couple of different episodes, particularly in Sending and Receiving Thoughts, who was somewhat famous for writing a book and doing an experiment in ESP on sending and receiving thoughts and documenting it. In his book, How to Make ESP Work for You, has a chapter on messages and guidance from the departed. I thought I would share this with you as a way to filter this information and then discuss it and get your ideas. Can we communicate with the departed? Messages and guidance from the departed. In 1929, when we lived in an apartment house in New York City, we became acquainted with a couple named McAllister who lived on the same floor. Charles McAllister was a magnificent figure of a man, over six feet tall, a soldierly bearing who had been a member of the famous Rainbow Division during the First World War. He had been awarded medals for bravery under fire, had been severely wounded, but apparently had made a complete recovery. Mrs. Sherman and I observed that the McAllisters lived almost entirely to themselves. Among their few visitors were Charles' two teenage sons by a former marriage who always came to spend holidays with their father. I was writing sports books in those days, and Mac, as I called him, would purchase autographed copies to present to the boys. One day Mac was taken to the hospital. It appeared that his old war injury now had resulted in cancer of the bladder. He was operated upon and invalid in his home. I was shocked to see him, thin and emaciated, walking with a cane, no longer the vigorous, vital man he once had been. This thing's got me, he said to me grimly. It's just a matter of time. I tried to make some philosophical statements, which might prove reassuring, but Mac was a realist and would have none of what he called soft soap. In the war, he said, I had a fighting chance, and I came through. But when cancer hits you, it taps. Mac hesitated, looking hard at me for a moment, and continued, Sherman, as you know, in some of our talks, we've discussed the possibility of life after death. I'm not a church-going sort, and I frankly don't know whether there's any future existence or not. Since I'm apt to die before you do, I'd like to make a pact that if I survive in any intelligent form, I'll try to find a way to communicate with you. Mac, you're liable to live a long time yet, I protested. 
while I could get hit and killed by a taxi tomorrow, let's apply the pact both ways. Max smiled. Okay, he said, but you know damned well I'm going to get there ahead of you. This is a subject that for some reason most people do not feel comfortable talking about, so we left it at that. Some weeks later, Mrs. McAllister reported that Mac had taken a turn for the worse and had been taken back to the hospital. Then, one morning around four o'clock, she phoned to say she had been informed that Mac was dying and would I please go to the hospital with her. When we arrived on the floor of the Fifth Avenue Hospital where Mac had his room, we heard his groans as we got off the elevator, looking in at the door. I saw Mac fully conscious, propped up in bed, his hands up over his head, grasping the enamel rungs. In a corner of his mouth was a cigarette that his nurse had lighted for him. It sagged against his cheek as he took a puff, and then between groans which he was trying to suppress, he looked up and saw me. Mrs. McAllister had turned her back and hidden her face in her hands. Mac's lips moved and the cigarette dropped out, he said with an effort. Hello, Sherman. Hello, Mac, I answered and took Mrs. McAllister by the arm, escorting her to the bedside. She found it impossible to conceal her admixture of fear and grief in the presence of approaching death, and Mac was quick to notice this. His eyes were developing a fixedness as he looked from her to me and said in a low voice, Totally exhausted. Totally exhausted. Mrs. McAllister, who had stood speechless, almost frozen at the head of the bed, began to cry. Max, seeing this, lifted his right arm and gave it a waving motion almost as though he were losing control of it. I thought for a moment he had lost the power to talk and was attempting to wave goodbye, but I cut off the impulse to wave back. Oh, Mac! Mrs. McAllister sobbed and reached out a hand to touch his shoulder. Mac appeared more distressed at her reaction than concerned over his own condition. He looked almost imploringly up at me, and as though marshalling all his remaining strength, once more lifted his right arm in a limp, waving gesture in the direction of the door. It suddenly came to me that he wanted me to take Mrs. McAllister from the room so she would not have to see him die. I touched her arm and nodded toward the door, and she turned, weeping away from the bed, going out ahead of me. I stopped at the door and looked back. Mac's eyes had been following me, and as we gazed at one another, he drew his last breath. He had been a soldier, and a stoic to the end. But now that he had passed on, the drama had just begun. Mrs. McAllister confessed to me that she and Mac never had been married. She'd been living with him as a kind of common-law wife. His first wife, the mother of his two sons, had been opposed to divorce but upon separation had been willing for Mac to take up with another woman. He had respected her religious convictions and the supposed Mrs. McAllister had been willing to accept this relationship. Now that Mac was dead, however, she explained to me that she had no legal right or say in the disposal of his affairs or even the arrangements for his funeral. Would I, under these circumstances, please phone his actual wife and break the news to her and ask what she wanted done? I did this. Two days later, in a funeral chapel, I attended the service for Charles S. McAllister. Present, beside myself, were the two wives and the two boys. Several weeks following the funeral, the Mrs. McAllister we knew departed for a trip west and stepped out of our lives. This then was the background which set the stage for a most unusual psychic event, which was to take place some months later, almost a thousand miles away. Uncle Doc passes on. On October 14, 1929, we received a wire from Marion, Indiana, stating that Uncle Doc Baldwin had died of a cerebral hemorrhage. I went back for the funeral and found Aunt Flora prostrated with shock. Her only daughter, Lillian, who had been called home from her teaching position in another city, told me that Aunt Flora had written her about having gone to see a medium named Mrs. Brown, who lived on the outskirts of Marion. Lillian proposed that since I had been away from Marion for some five years and would not be known to Mrs. Brown, I call on this woman for a psychic reading with the hope that she might give some message from Uncle Doc. Lillian said that Mrs. Brown did not have a telephone and she understood that the house did not even have electricity, but she felt it was better for purposes of a test if I went out to see her unannounced. This was the night before the funeral. 
Lillian, on the excuse of doing some errands downtown, took me along. She drove out of the vicinity of the Brown home and parked a block away so that the Baldwin car would not be recognized. Then she pointed out the location of the Brown house, and I walked the remaining distance. It was a starless night. There were no street lights. The little frame house had a front and side porch. It was totally dark, and though it was only eight in the evening, I thought the Browns were either away or already had retired. As I ascended the steps to the porch, a black cat suddenly ran across in front of me and clawed its way up a drain pipe onto the roof. I regarded this as an auspicious as well as a chilling introduction to my hoped-for seance. My rap on the glass of the front door brought no immediate response, and I was about to turn away with the conclusion that there was no one there. When a door to the back of the house opened, and I saw the figure of an elderly man carrying a kerosene lamp coming toward me in his bare feet. He opened the door a crack and peered out at me. Is this Mr. Brown? I asked. Yes, he said. If you've come to see Ma, you're too late. She's gone upstairs to bed. I've been working all day for the city, digging ditches, and my feet are sore. I've been soaking them in the kitchen. I almost didn't hear you. I'm sorry to disturb you, I persisted, but it's still rather early, and I'll be greatly disappointed if I can't see Mrs. Brown. I've heard so much about her. I was talking purposely loud enough so that my voice could be heard upstairs, just as I hoped Mrs. Brown called down. Pa, tell the gentleman to come in and sit him in the parlor. I'll be down in a few minutes. Within a few minutes, I heard Mrs. Brown descending the stairs. It was immediately apparent that she was having difficulty doing so, and when she came into view, I could see that she was limping. She was a short, white-haired, rather plump woman with a warm, friendly manner. You'll have to excuse me, she said, but I've been having trouble with rheumatism and my joints are stiff. She crossed over and sat down on the couch, propping one leg upon it. Have to get myself comfortable, she said. You just want a reading? Yes, I said. Whatever you are accustomed to doing. She looked at me a moment, not asking me my name or anything about me, and then closed her eyes and rubbed her forehead and finally started talking. It's strange, she said. I see you with a pencil and paper. You are doing a lot of writing and you seem to be surrounded by boys, not just a few boys, hundreds of them, maybe thousands, and they all appear to be interested in what you're writing. I don't know what to make of this. That's very good, I said, feeling she deserved encouragement. At that time, I was writing sport and adventure stories for Boys Life, the official Boy Scout publication, as well as my sport novels, which were read by thousands of boys. Her tune in on this activity hardly could have been more accurate. She continued with impressions which were generally correct. When she had finished, she opened her eyes and looked questioningly at me. Did I get anything worthwhile? she asked. Yes, as far as you went, I said. But I was hoping you might give me a message from someone on the other side of life. Oh, I never do that, said Mrs. Brown, unless it's requested because some people don't believe in that kind of reading. But since you've asked me, I don't mind telling you that when I came downstairs, I saw two spirits in the room with you. I didn't try to determine who they were, but one of them was a young man in a military uniform. Let me relax and I'll see if I can make contact with them again. She shut her eyes and leaned back and remained silent for a few minutes. Then she opened her eyes and gave me a searching glance. Why, Doc Baldwin's here, she announced, and his son Ashton is with him. Do you have any connections with them? I might, I admitted, but Mrs. Brown chuckled as she broke in to say, of course you do. Doc Baldwin is telling me that you're his favorite nephew, Harold Sherman, who has come all the way from New York to attend his funeral. That's correct. Both Doc and Ashton want me to greet you for them, and Doc says to tell Flora that he's been meeting plenty of these and thous over here. This remark, as reported, was unusually characteristic of Uncle Doc's way of talking and was a reference to his many Quaker relatives. I sat trying to analyze how Mrs. Brown was getting these impressions, and I decided that she could just have made a lucky guess as to my identity. I had been well known during the three years I had spent in Marion on the newspaper, and while I had never met her or heard about her, she had known both Uncle Doc and Aunt Flora. She might even have read a mention of my arrival in Marion for the funeral. These at least were the possibilities I was turning over in my mind when Mrs. Brown suddenly stiffened put both hands over her face and cried out, Oh, I'm being taken away from here, and I'm being shown a hospital room in New York City. There's a man lying propped on a bed, and he's suffering. My, how he's suffering. There are two people standing beside the bed. One of them is a woman, and the other is you. 
the spirit who was in that bed is here now and he is showing me this scene so you can identify it. He's telling me that he promised you if there was a life after death, he would try to get in touch with you. Do you recognize this scene? My mind had been so intent upon the purpose of my visit to Mrs. Brown and a desired message from Uncle Doc that what Mrs. Brown was now saying did not register. No, I'm sorry, I said. I can't make anything of it. Can whoever it is give you his name? He's trying so hard, said Mrs. Brown, her eyes closed and reaching out a hand towards some invisible presence. I can't quite make it out. He says his name is Charles. Sal Mac. Uh, Charles S. I just can't get his last name. By this time, I knew who it was beyond any doubt, and I was concerned that if she made too great an effort to get the exact last name, she might lose the contact, as I had seen other sensitives do. I'll help you out a little, I said. You have the first name and middle initial exactly right. His name is Charles S., and his last name is McAllister. Oh, thank you, said Mrs. Brown. He's so happy to have gotten through to you. And now he's holding up four fingers in one hand is telling me to tell you there were only four people directly concerned with his passing. That's right, I said, remembering the four who were present at the funeral, his two wives and two sons. Now I'm seeing the hospital room in the bed again, reported Mrs. Brown. I see him lifting his arm like this, and she lifted her own arm and went through the motion I had seen Mac make that night. He says to me that you've never been sure whether he was waving goodbye or was motioning for you to leave the room, but he wants you to know now that you did right in taking his wife out. That's what he meant when he did this. And here Mrs. Brown half opened her eyes, looked toward the doorway in her home, and repeated the movement of the arm. It was a remarkable demonstration for which I had no immediate explanation, but I wanted to get all the evidential information I could, so I asked, can he tell me what he died of? Instantly, Mrs. Brown placed a hand on her body and cried out, oh, what pain. He places his hand here and he tells me, cancer of the bladder. Just at this moment, two giggling schoolgirls looking for thrills came running up on the porch, stumbled in the dark, and fell. There was more laughter as though they considered this a lark. Mrs. Brown jumped and put a hand to her head. I'm sorry, she said. It's all gone. I can't do anything more. I left her home convinced that she was a sincere and genuine sensitive. She told me she had this ability since she was a child and would see relatives and friends who had gone on and would talk to them, sometimes before people in her community even knew they were dead. She couldn't tell how she did it. She said she simply sat and made her mind receptive, and if any spirits were around, she began to perceive them and hear voices. I might have had some reason to doubt her impressions about my writing activities, as well as what she had told me about Uncle Doc and Ashton, but she could not possibly have known the intimate details of my experience with Charles McAllister. Certainly this experience was farthest from my conscious mind, and to have selected it from my subconscious by telepathy would have been a phenomenal feat in itself. If, on the other hand, the communication had indeed been Charles McAllister as represented, it would indicate that identity, memory, and purpose are retained by the survivor in the next mode of existence. There are, however, many baffling factors to weigh against such authentic demonstrations of extrasensory powers, as I have herein stated. It is only truthful to report that years later in New York, Mrs. Sherman and I learned that John Slater, then over 80, was making an appearance at Carnegie Hall and would also give a limited number of private seances. We had told several of our New York friends about the amazing reading he had given us in Detroit, and they accompanied us when we went to see and hear him in high anticipation. His public demonstration, to our disappointment, was unconvincing. Nevertheless, we hopefully arranged for a private appointment only to be let down again. Not one impression was correct. We told him we had a wonderful experience through him in Detroit years before, but he seemed disinterested and dismissed us with a slight show of irritation. We were informed later that he had been drinking heavily and was in bad health, which may have accounted in part for his loss of extrasensory power. It seems to be the history of many sensitives that they lose their mental and emotional balance at different times during their careers. The opening of their minds to so many different influences and the taking on of all manner of conditions is not only a great psychic strain, but also a severe physical strain. This is why I have emphasized again and again the necessity of developing mental and emotional control as a prerequisite to the exploration of the higher realms of mind. Throughout the years, 
as might be expected, I've attended many seances of every imaginable kind and have investigated many so-called materializing trumpet, direct voice, and mental message-bearing mediums in both dark rooms and daylight settings. I am compelled to say that a high percentage of those professional demonstrators did not produce convincing evidence they had been in touch with any intelligences beyond the earth plane. Some of them gave indication they possessed certain phases of extrasensory perceptive ability such as telepathy, psychometry, clairvoyance, clairaudience, and occasionally precognition, but the majority of these psychics were either out-and-out -out frauds or self-deluded people. However, about 5% of all whom I met personally and whose work I have witnessed have possessed undoubted powers of mind, which have transcended the physical. They have produced phenomenon as undeniable as they have been unexplainable on any scientific basis. It is this hard core of genuine sensitives, by and large, that also has profoundly impressed earlier scientists and investigators around the world. Even a few indisputable demonstrations of apparent communication with disembodied entities are all that is needed to indicate the definite possibility of survival of consciousness after death. But it stands to reason that any individual departing this life would prefer, on discovering that he still lives on another plane, to make direct contact with loved ones he has left behind rather than to try to reach those loved ones through the minds of strangers. Thousands of reports I have received give evidence that many such direct contacts have been made. There is scarcely a family circle without some member who has had a vision or voiced a mental message received from someone who has gone on. I myself have had quite a number of verified experiences similar to those which have been described to me. Rendezvous in the Afterlife one of the most outstanding experiences occurred in 1949, the year my book, You Live After Death, was published, when we were living in our country home in the Arkansas Ozarks. As comparatively new residents at that time, we had made friends with Marge Lyon, the Chicago Tribune columnist, author of the Sunday feature Marge of Sunrise Farm, who lived across the state in the picturesque resort town of Eureka Springs. As a prelude to one of the most unusual happenings of my life, Marge phoned Martha and me to invite us to spend the weekend with Judge Lyon and herself. They wished to hold a literate party in our honor and discuss You Live After Death, which she said had particularly captivated the judge. The judge, Marge's husband, was 20 years her senior and one of her favorite characters in her Sunday write-ups in the Tribune, but he would have been a character without her writing about him. He had been elected Justice of the Peace time and again by his home people who held him in great esteem and affection. Outwardly, the judge was salty-tongued, sometimes biting, opinionated, domineering. Inwardly, he had the warmest of hearts, a do-good nature, and an enormous interest in people. He believed, with Mark Twain, that the only trouble with human nature is human nature. Our weekend with the Lions and their friends proved unforgettable for reasons that soon will become apparent. They had invited about 15 friends from the art and writing colonies of Eureka Springs to participate in a bull session. Most of the guests had read my book and were prepared to discuss the evidence I had presented. During the animated conversation which ensued, Judge Lyon was the most vigorous assenter and dissenter. He would break in time and again by saying, shut up and listen to me. As brusque as it may have sounded, no one resented his interruptions. They knew this was characteristic of him, that when he had something on his mind, he just couldn't wait to get it off. And besides, his comments were usually so colorful and so pointed, they were well worth listening to. Marge Lyon, in laughing and apologizing for her husband's break-in, said, It's no use. I've locked myself in my room to write, but if the judge gets an idea he wants to discuss with me, he threatens to break down the door unless I let him in so he can unload. When the judge has something on his mind, you're just going to listen. I was to recall this trait in time to come, but that night all I distinctly remembered was Judge's climactic remark, Well, Sherman, I don't know whether we live after we die or not, but I'll promise you one thing, if I die before you do, and the chances are a thousand to one that I will, and if I find there is a life after death, I'll try to communicate with you and give you some real evidence, evidence that will stand up in court. Some months later, Judge Lyon suffered a stroke and subsequently died. More months passed and I was busy writing my next book, 
which was to be titled Anyone Can Stop Drinking. We had not seen Marge Lyon or corresponded after writing letters of sympathy and receiving a reply. There was nothing of an associative nature to have suggested in any way what now took place. One day, as I was seated at my typewriter, working on the book manuscript, my mind was seized with the sudden, unmistakable feeling that Judge Lyon was present. It was the same kind of feeling I had experienced years before during my experiments in long-distance telepathy with Sir Hubert Wilkins. It seemed that Judge Lyon was there, in the atmosphere, standing beside me, although I could not see him with my physical eyesight. It has been my habit, when unusual impressions have come to mind, to mention them to Mrs. Sherman as an aid in substantiating whatever I might be about to receive. On this occasion, I called to my wife, Martha, I have a feeling that Judge Lyon is here. Mrs. Sherman has long been accustomed to such remarks of mine at odd times of the day or night, and she simply replied, that's interesting, knowing that any protracted comment would be disturbing to me. The unseen visitor dictates a message. Now in my mind's ear, I heard Judge Lyons say, in the tone of voice I remembered, Sherman, take that piece of copy out of your typewriter and put in a sheet of your stationery. I've got a message for Marge. Obedient to this request, I did as instructed. Then I waited for the message, but no message was forthcoming, although I sensed the presence of the judge very strongly beside me. Finally, I typed in the date, line, addressed the letter to Marge, and wrote an introductory paragraph telling her I had been trying to work on my new book, that I'd been overwhelmed by the feeling that the judge had barged in and wanted me to deliver a message of some kind. I warned Marge that this could easily be my imagination, but that the feeling was strong and it was similar to other feelings I had had in the past which had proved evidential. Once I had finished this paragraph, I heard an inward voice, tell Marge, don't you do it, you'll regret it as long as you live if you do. I typed these words as though taking dictation. Then I naturally asked in my own mind, don't do what? Quick as a flash came the mental answer. She'll know what I mean. I typed, the judge says you'll know what he means. Then sat quietly, conscious of the judge's continued presence awaiting a further message. There was none. I added several paragraphs telling Marge what Martha and I had been doing since we had seen her last and expressing the wish to get together in the near future. I repeated my warning that this message could be a quirk of my imagination, but that I felt impelled to send it on to her, nevertheless. Then, as I was about to sign off and take the piece of stationery from the typewriter, the judge suddenly intervened. Wait a minute, he commanded me mentally. This is very important. You've been wanting proof of life after death. I'm giving it to you. Put the time on this letter. I typed the time 2.07 p.m., just below the dateline. I could feel a deep sense of satisfaction from the unseen presence. I took the letterhead out, signed it, addressed an envelope to Marge, sealed it with the enclosure, and tossed it up on a corner of my desk, intending to get back to my own creative work. But the judge wasn't through with me yet. Now, he demanded, take that letter into town and mail it to Marge. This was asking too much. It was 10 miles to town over gravel roads, 20 miles round trip. It would take more than an hour but try as I could to get my mind back on my writing assignment just wasn't any use. The judge kept pestering me mentally. Take that letter into town and mail it to Marge. I called Martha in, read her the carbon letter I had written to Marge, and told her there was nothing for me to do but drop everything and drive into town and discharge the order. The instant I dropped the letter in the box at the post office, it was though heavy pressure had been released from my mind. The feeling of the judge's presence vanished. Indeed, it left me wondering whether he had been there at all. My wondering and my doubts increased as days went by and re received no answering word from Marge. Now I rebuked myself. I said to Martha, Why'd you ever let me send that letter to Marge? I'm sure she hasn't been able to make head or tail of the message. It is meaningless to her and she is embarrassed. She didn't want to hurt my feelings, but she probably thinks I'm nuts. With the passing of two weeks, I was certain in my conscious mind, which is the reasoning, wondering, doubting, calculating, assimilating mind, limited by the physical senses, as you remember, that this message from the judge had been a figment of my imagination. About this time, Martha and I decided to visit our daughter, Marcia, and her family, then living in Fort Worth, Texas. We planned to leave a day early and motor to Hot Springs, Arkansas, where our friend, Governor Sid McMath, 
was opening his campaign for re-election in the ballpark that night. As we were about to enter the field box in front of the grandstand, we heard the excited voice of a woman calling to us, Harold, Martha, oh, it is good to see you. We turned and saw Marge Lyon running to greet us. After affectionate greetings, Marge turned to me, oh, Harold, since your remarkable letter came, I have been planning to take off and come to see you about it. It's something I just couldn't write about in a letter. But one thing and another has prevented me from getting away. Harold, do you know what I was at 2.07 in the afternoon on the day you received your message from the judge? I have no idea, I said. I was up in the Boston Mountains, she said, on Highway 71 between Fayetteville and Little Rock at a home which has one of the most beautiful views I've ever seen. I was with a woman friend of mine and I fell so in love with this place that I decided to buy it. I told the owners that I would have to go and make arrangements with my bank and put my home in Eureka Springs up for sale. And then I would return later that day and make a down payment. That is exactly when you got the message from the judge. Tell Marge, don't you do it. You'll regret it as long as you live if you do. Well, I motored to Little Rock, made arrangements at the bank and started back, still intent on buying the property. But the closer I got to the place, the more my enthusiasm began to wane. I finally started asking myself, what are you doing? All your roots during your married life are down in Eureka Springs. All your friends and club activities and interests are there. You're just in love with a view. In a few days, when this view becomes commonplace, you will go so lonely away from all the friends, you won't be able to stand it. Once I had this perspective, I dropped all thoughts of buying the place and drove right on past without stopping. Next morning, when I got to our old home in Eureka Springs, which never looked so good, I found your letter in the box. Harold Sherman, no one ever can convince me that the judge did not get through to you. I can see just how he did it. He must have been with me that afternoon when I was looking at that place, and when he saw I was intent on buying it, he tried to reach me directly, but my mind was so intent on what I wanted to do, he couldn't break it through. How natural then for the judge to think of you, so he impressed himself upon you till you picked up his message, and so you were moved by him that you even went into town to mail the letter. After that, it is evident that the judge returned to me and kept hounding me until he got through enough to make me wonder why I was buying the place. Once I got over the fixation on the property, I could see it would have been a colossal mistake, and as the judge said, I'd regret it as long as I lived. But how can you write about things like this? I just had to see you folks and tell you my experiences in person and say that I haven't the slightest doubt about life after death anymore. Among the many extrasensory experiences I have had, that one remains a standout. Consider the factors involved in this communication. Had this been a telepathic experience, and had I been receiving impressions from the mind of Marge Lyon, I would have been impressed by the fact that she was intent on buying the property. Her consciousness was obsessed with this desire at 2.07 in the afternoon, so I could have gotten no warning feeling, don't you do it from her. It is significant that the intelligence which made contact with my mind first made a point of establishing its identity before attempting to present a message. Then, knowing that the time of receipt of this message was important as evidence, I was directed to put the time on my letter. For me to have recorded a message absolutely the reverse of Marge's feelings and intentions at the moment would seem to rule out any possibility of any other source but the one represented the entity of Judge Lyon. In similar experiences of this nature, I have observed that I am first impressed by the feeling of a presence which catches my mind's attention. Then, as I hold my consciousness receptive, this feeling usually develops into a mental image of the entity, apparently trying to communicate. This is in striking contrast to the times when I receive spontaneous telepathic impressions from the mind of a living person. When this happens, I may get a sudden sensing of a thought or an event related to such a person wherein I am conscious of the individual and the thought or event at the same time. But afterlife impressions are always preceded by the attempt of the communicating entity to establish first its identity before trying to get a message through. Also significant, at least in the kind of communication I've experienced, is the fact that the departed loved ones have had specific reasons for wanting to get in touch with friends and relatives still on earth. Usually the messages I have received have been of such a personal nature that recipients, while supplying me with signed statements as to their authenticity, have requested that I do not reveal their names. A strange source of business knowledge. 
I mention now only two of this number. Mrs. Sherman and I, in 1958, were motoring to Phoenix, Arizona, where I was to deliver a series of lectures. While driving, a strong impression came to me of the presence in the car of a close friend, a man whose initials shall be WB. I dictated to Mrs. Sherman the message I heard him speaking to me in my mind's ear. WB urged me to warn his wife, who had been running his business following his demise, not to have anything to do with a certain man who wanted to purchase an interest in the company. Not knowing anything about her business affairs, and never having heard of the other individual in question, nor even knowing the whereabouts of WB's wife, I hesitated about writing to her, but again the mental pressure was so strong that I finally addressed a letter to her permanent post office box number for forwarding. In a few days, she phoned from an East Coast city to tell me that the night before my letter arrived, she had been awakened by WB, whom she saw standing by her bedside. So real and lifelike, she felt she could have reached out and touched him. Then she heard him distinctly say to her, kick that man out. The next morning came my letter with the message, have nothing to do with this man. She said she had no reason to suspect that he wasn't the right sort and had been seriously considering his offer feeling that she should have a man in the business to help her. But these warnings had caused her to check more carefully and her investigation had revealed that involvement with this man would have been ruinous. She ended by expressing appreciation for my passing on the message from WB. She said she was writing me full details which I have in my files. Can a spirit watch over a loved one? On another occasion I received a sudden impression that a friend of mine in the Midwest had been taken seriously ill. I heard from him only infrequently, and had no conscious reason to be concerned about his health, but I wrote SR at once to inquire how things were with him. Soon I had a wire from his wife stating that at the time I received the impression SR had been seized with a severe heart attack and rushed to the hospital. He died several weeks later. Some months following this I dreamed about him and felt his presence the next morning. As though he were greatly disturbed about something, he was in the back of my mind all day and finally broke through in early evening with the message that his wife was so grief-stricken and despondent that she intended to commit suicide. He exhorted me to write to her and assure her that he still lived, that he knew what she was going through, but that she must not think as she was thinking and that things would be better if she just held on. I got this letter off immediately. His wife phoned me later greatly moved, sobbing that it had arrived just in time to save her life. Such messages are more indicative of possible communication between the so-called physical and non-physical worlds than messages wherein spirits attempt to prove their identity by recounting experiences they had while on earth. Such experiences also are recorded in the minds of living relatives and friends. Anything in the minds of these people to be ascertained telepathically by a medium and mistakenly interpreted as coming from the purported spirit. This is one of the major reasons where actual communication with anyone in the afterlife is so difficult to demonstrate and to prove, but cases wherein the communicators show a knowledge of current happenings and a desire to be helpful, supplying information not in the minds of any living individuals are always much more convincing. Here is a further observation worthy of thoughtful consideration. Most of my impressions from discarnate beings have come to me shortly following their passing, or within the first few months or a year. Later contact has become more and more infrequent, and while it is not impossible to hear from a departed loved one even years after death, such occasions are a rarity. This would suggest that the interest of deceased persons is strongest in the initial stages of the change called death and that as they adjust to this new form of existence, they become more and more demagnetized from the loved ones and from conditions they left behind. Many loved ones, when critically ill, have called members of their families to the bedside and pleaded with them to let me go, don't hold on to me, let me depart in peace. In those sensitized moments, they have been made aware of what I have described as the electromagnetic bond which has become established on subconscious levels between the minds of those who care deeply for one another and have realized that these bonds must be severed before they can free their spirit for its transition into the next dimension. Words are a poor substitute for feelings and inner experiences, but in our stage of development they are 
the only tools we possess as a means of communicating our thoughts to others. The faculties of extrasensory perception function exclusively on the feeling level of mind and words often have to be found by the receiver to describe or define impressions. On occasion, an attunement can be established between two minds in such a manner that it almost simulates a telephone connection. Under these conditions, the inner ear seems to hear the voice of the transmitter and words come into consciousness as though being remembered from a past actual conversation or as though communication is taking place at the very moment. Sir Herbert Wilkins left this life on December 1st, 1958, because I had been identified with him in the famous series of long-distance telepathic experiments. I often have been asked if I ever received any impressions of things that happened to Wilkins after our experiments were concluded, or if I ever felt that I have heard from him after his death. The answer to both questions is yes. Messages from Wilkins after his death. In the years following our experiments, Wilkins was employed by the U.S. military in research work. He kept a permanent address in Washington, D.C., but was in the field most of the time. We corresponded every few months. One time when I was writing him from Chicago with my mind's attention fixed upon him, I suddenly felt impelled to add a postscript. I see you surrounded by smoke and flame. You seem to be choking and coughing. I cannot account for this peculiar impression, but feel you had a narrow escape of some kind. It was some weeks later when Wilkins returned to Washington and found my letter awaiting him that he wrote, How odd that you received this impression on that day and date I was testing a new asbestos suit for the army. I was walking through a fire created by 500 gallons of high-test gasoline. In the midst of this fire, the suit sprang a leak and I was suffocated before they could get me out. At another time when riding Wilkins and concentrating upon him, my mind picked up the impression of an accident. I felt that he had suffered a shoulder injury as well as an arm injury and so reported it to him. Again, he wrote back confirming this impression by saying he had been returning to Washington in a bus which swerved off the highway to avoid a head-on collision and turned over in a river. He had given his seat to an elderly woman and had moved toward the back of the bus just before the crash occurred. She was drowned and two other passengers were killed. Wilkins escaped with a broken collarbone and an injured arm. And it's still another time when writing him, I said that I felt a lame feeling in my chest which was associated with him and wondered what this could mean. He replied he had been carrying a watermelon on his Pennsylvania farm and had slipped and fallen, cracking several ribs. All of these impressions served once more to demonstrate the relationship of feeling and the functioning of extrasensory perception. Each incident had registered strongly upon Wilkins' emotions as well as his mind. The fact that I found myself able to receive thought impressions from him even years after our regularly scheduled experiments also indicated that a powerful affinity had been set up between us and had continued to exist. This being true, it would suggest that if the mind of the man survives death, if he still retains his memory and his intelligence, it should be possible for the mind of anyone who has left this life to communicate, mind to mind, with an individual still on earth. Wilkins and I had discussed this possibility, but we had made no pact in the event one or the other of us should embark on the greatest adventure of all. However, Wilkins was conditioned to think of me as I was of him, and I sent out the thought that my mind would be receptive to any transmission from him at any time. But these years following Wilkins' passing have been exceptionally busy, creative ones for me, and I have not been in a time or place where I could set aside regular hours for attempted communications. Even so, I have kept a careful record of occasions when I felt Wilkins did reach me, and am herewith reporting what I seemed to receive from him under two different dates. When these contacts with my mind were made, I felt Wilkins' presence as though he were in the room and was able to relax and dictate word for word what came through. In this way, I was not troubled by the mechanics of writing and could keep my entire attention upon the impressions of his voice which appeared to be talking to me in my mind's ear. Hollywood, California, April 25th, 1959. Hello, Sherman. It is not easy to get through. I've been trying for some time. I find that each mind is like a miniature universe, a collection of magnetized ideas or concepts revolving around a nucleus or center which represents the entity itself. The entity holds these ideas or concepts in what the world would call today its orbit, and it's difficult to get through this magnetic field from outside. 
I can realize now what a monumental attempt you made to receive what you called thought impressions from me during our experiments. This universe is not at all like man has described it in his books and scientific treatises. It is difficult to get away from a planet on which you are born because of the hold its energy particles have upon you. This is why I am glad I had the body which the world knew as Wilkins returned to the fires so that its ashes might more speedily be freed from any identification with me. It was a source of profound satisfaction to have these ashes released at the North Pole and to have it done by those new under-ice pioneers. They are going to realize my dreams, dreams I find which no single entity really completes in any life but leaves for others to carry on. I'm watching you reach out for my thoughts with your mind as I dispatch them through the magnetic field of your consciousness. It is interesting to me to see how these thought impulses travel through your mind circuits to your points of awareness, where you put these impulses which become feelings into words. It is quite a process. Once mental contact is made, you have to hold to it by a sort of fixation, and I can perceive that receiving is more difficult than transmitting. I have only to concentrate my forces on you, but you have to stop temporarily the machinery of your own mind to let me through to the point of awareness. You have to picture me as I was, not as I am, but no one ever sees the true entity. It is always surrounded by a form in any dimension and apparently remains an eternal mystery to itself. At this point, the persistent buzz of the apartment doorbell broke in and Mrs. Sherman had to answer the door. It was the houseman with a package. The communication was then resumed. I perceive you are getting tired and have had an interruption which requires a displacement of energy. You're now resisting this word I am sending through to you because you think it sounds so bromidically English. It is simply a sign-off and the word is Cheerio, and my name, as you have often seen it, I am writing in your mind as Wilkins. Hollywood, California, June 13, 1959. Hello, Sherman. I have been making a study of the mind circuits with others who are interested in opening up reliable and provable channels of communication. I now can realize why more contact has not been made between the two worlds of the living and the dead. You have the language barrier on earth which means if you do not understand a language, it is only a series of unintelligible sounds to you, because the mind of the average human is centered upon his existence in the flesh and his attention is fixed for the most part on his outer rather than his inner life, he automatically rejects thoughts and impressions which he might otherwise receive and identify from the minds of those who have gone on as they say. It will require the establishment of what might be termed listening posts on the interior levels of mind on the part of those interested in and capable of reception, of thoughts and of regularly prescribed intervals such as we set up in our experiments for any dependable results to be obtained. Trained, sleeping subjects are the best in many ways because the machinery of their minds is at a position of comparative rest. But when all circuits of mind are engaged in ordinary conscious and subconscious activity, it is extremely difficult to reach and impress the entity. This is a hard point to get across, but perhaps I can illustrate it by reminding you that different organs of the body are utilized to perform different functions at different times. But never together. Nature closes off one function to permit another to be performed by the same organ as the occasion demands. In the case of the sexes, dual utility is obvious. One function must be slowed or largely stopped before another can take over and use the same channels for another purpose. Since every mind circuit operates normally in what might be called a closed circuit, this circuit has to be opened either consciously or unconsciously before contact can be made with the thought current from the mind of another, either flushed or unflushed. This is the problem and it is not without dangers because thoughts carry a charge with them and have a tendency to influence whatever consciousness wherein they find lodgment, either for good or ill. We are existing in a field of constantly changing what you call electromagnetic phenomena. This is as good a description as any since no words can really describe it. If you could sense the wheels within wheels within wheels in the interrelated activity of all minds on the human creature level, it would be overwhelming. This activity is ceaseless 
never changing, and no mind remains exactly the same in consciousness as it reacts to experience from one moment to the other. Body forms are changing from the instant of conception and every particle in them changes as do the minds in control of these bodies and particles. Your own mind is now resisting the reception of names recognizable to the world and entities interested in attempting to establish communication, some of whom I've been brought in touch with here simply because you feel these names might be obvious and induced by your imagination. You are so desirous of screening out everything which might seem like a machination of your own mind that it is difficult to introduce or mention recognizable personalities to your consciousness. I guess this will have to wait until you feel more assured that this may be a genuine contact. Again, cheerio, this is Wilkins signing off. Much was given me over which was to ponder. I am still studying in an attempt to find ways to make my mind a clear channel through which to receive impressions. There is so much that remains a mystery, so little yet known, so much to be known, but perhaps you will be prompted, even inspired, to join me in this exploration. I look to the future with hope and high expectancy. So to review, those who have gone into the spirit world seem to communicate at strange times and in strange ways. In one such case, communications with one spirit came unexpectedly through a medium who had been visited for the purpose of getting in touch with a different spirit. Spiritual communications appear to be a strain on the mind. Mediums may lose their power or deteriorate mentally and physically. It is noticeable that the personalities of the departed come through in spiritual communication. Also, they appear to keep watch on loved ones left behind and attempt to give advice on business or personal affairs. Sometimes, not being able to reach the loved ones directly, they find a sensitive who will relay a message, always wondering if it is a figment of his imagination. In the case of Sir Hubert Wilkins, a close telepathic contact during his life appeared to continue after death. Long, informative messages appear in the mind of his lifetime contact. I'm fascinated by this. I'm fascinated to hear your stories. And I will be incredibly excited to read the comments. Tell me your stories. Have you spoken to the dead? Yes, the Bible warns against this. And perhaps it is a figment of your imagination, or you're contacting a portion of the Akashic that is a recording of that person made conscious. I don't believe that that's what's happening. I believe that our consciousness does exist for a given period of time as indicated here, not forever. During this transition phase after death, there is a period of time where the soul watches over you. And it's really interesting. When my mom died, I became really nervous whenever I would, you know, be in my room or looking at a certain website. I always felt like my mom was looking over my shoulder saying, oh no, you're not going to do that. So it really is interesting. I know that people here will comment upon that. If you've had somebody die in your life and then you go about your normal activities, you feel like they're there and hey, maybe I need to put some clothes on, change my underwear. So everybody has a different experience. It is something that has affected me from childhood as I've seen people in my family do this like it was no big deal. And I'm fascinated by it. I do believe people become sensitized to it that do this from childhood and that it is a skill that you can come to improve over time that some people, their minds are so active and talkative that they can't listen to voices coming through and that people are trying to contact you all the time and that the door is shut. And that's probably what's happening. So as you open yourself in meditation, it's similar to channeling, but as you open yourself and don't simply do the thinking, but let go and be the receptor, you're receiving a lot of information and and you'll start to hear that voice or different voices. Write it down. Don't judge it. Don't ignore it. This information could be helpful to you and it might not be. Don't make it overly important because I don't think the entity would want you to do that. Don't make it change your life. But take the information that you get and share it with others. And I think that over time, if we did a long-term study, it took a million people and asked them, have you ever spoken to the dead? We would be shocked at the number of people that do it. 
I have a feeling millions of people do it all the time and they don't share it because they think that they, it would be an embarrassing thing to talk about. Of course, there's a part of us that deeply wants to speak to those people that we've lost. There are people in my life that I would just love to have another day with to speak to. And of course, my heart longs to see them. There are people that I cared about deeply that I've lost. Children of friends that just really touched me in a bad way that I felt like I was visited by them because they were not able to communicate with anybody else. In moments where I opened myself, I felt like they were like, finally, nobody will listen to me and I could talk to you. There was a portion of my own consciousness that didn't believe, but still opened myself up to it. And so that is what we're going through and that we're going to get better in this. And if we accept the possibility that this has happened, there's verifiable information from the past over the last 60 years that people have documented in communicating with the dead that can't be denied, that it's rare, it's difficult, and that if we do more research and discuss it openly, not embarrassed about it, don't be embarrassed if you're talking to the dead. Be open to this possibility. Share what you've experienced. And we may, in the process of sharing this, come to a realization that they aren't really dead. They're just in another place. And imagine a world where we unveiled this aspect of ourselves. We would, of course, lose the fear of death. And it would be an exciting revelation. And we could learn so much. And oftentimes you might hear a voice a voice that's speaking to you, that intuition, and it might not be you. It could be a descendant, a friend, somebody that's passed on that's trying to help you out. So listen to those words, write about it, document it. Check your body, look at the feelings that you're feeling and analyze it, share it with me. Tell me what you're experiencing. And as we do this, we become aware of our own inner voice, the voice of our higher selves, all of the guides that we have, as we tune into these voices, we start to differentiate them. And that process is a natural process. Just like growing up and learning how to walk, learning how to run, all those things that you did, we're learning how to receive thoughts both from the conscious world and the afterlife. And I would love to get your impressions of this and your feelings about it. All episodes of The Reality Revolution can be found at therealityrevolution.com. And welcome to the Reality Revolution.